Attention, attention, all personnel. Incoming podcast. This is MASH Matters. Over and out. It's MASH Matters, the podcast celebrating the greatest television series of all time, hosted by two guys who just absolutely adore that show to pieces. Who? Who? Who are they? One of them is me. My name is Ooh. Ryan Patrick. I'm a huge fan of the show. Ooh. And the other guy is you, Jeff Maxwell, who was on the show. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yes, I played Private Igor Straminsky, didn't I? And today we are also joined by two guests, one who was a big fan of the show and another Another who was on the show. We are uh, so thrilled to welcome back our friends Mike Farrell and Mark Freeman to talk about some fun stuff here. But before we get to our guests, we have a really cool announcement to make. <laughs> <laughs> Last year on Reels, they aired a documentary about MASH to celebrate the 50th anniversary of the pilot episode. You and I, Jeff, were uh, part of that documentary, along with some other people like, you know, Burt Metcalf and Mike Farrell and Jamie Farr and our friend Dan Harrison and some other folks who are associated with the show. And that aired on Reels last year. Well, now, because not everybody has access to Reels, no, it has been released on DVD. Yeah. Hot spit. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's called, actually. Hot spit. Hot spit. <laughs> the 50th anniversary. It's actually called MASH When Television Changed Forever. And you can buy a copy of that now. We have the link in the show notes for this episode. You can also find the link on our social media as well. And yeah. thanks to our, our friends over there, AMS Pictures, they have given us the opportunity to share a discount code with you. Use the code MASH Matters at checkout. You'll save 10% on the DVD. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Look what we're doing for everybody, for the world. Wow. We're saving the world 10% at a time. 10%. <laughs> So, yeah, but it is kind of neat because not everybody was able to see that show. I think my hair looked particularly good that day, don't yeah, you? It I mean, did. I, I it really did. I was pretty good. And I've told the story before. You, you drove me around when we were out there in your convertible and my forehead got sunburned. <laughs> And it's bright red. <laughs> I'm hoping they maybe they did some kind of remastering on the color balance for the DVD version. I, I will see. But make sure you buy a copy just so you can see Jeff's fantastic hair and my glowing forehead. <laughs> well, that's, that's California living. Come on. Why didn't I bring a hat? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But it is cool. It's a great DVD. It's got some bonus features on there, some never before seen footage. So make sure you pick it up. Again, you can find the link there in the show notes for this episode or on our social media pages. And there were a very nice group of people who shot that with us. We had a good time that day. Yes. Good company. Good group. Definitely take advantage of our 10% discount and see that DVD. Hey, and the holidays are coming up. Everybody wants yeah. that DVD. Come on. Darn straight. Now. Let's get to our guests, Mike Farrell and Mark Freeman. This episode is about preventative medicine, the episode preventative medicine. After researching it and having conversations with uh, Ryan Patrick and Mark Freeman, I thought that this was a really interesting episode for a couple of reasons. One, it really highlights the importance of the Bible. And the Bible was all of these conversations and interviews that Larry Gelbart had and Gene Reynolds had, and then later Bert Metcalf had with all of the physicians, doctors who were in Korea, Vietnam, Los Angeles, wherever they could talk to them, they got a lot of interviews and learned about what the real deal was all about. And that went into the Bible that the writers used for, I would assume, <laughs> probably 11 years. Uh, they would go back to the well and find out these real stories that they could use for the show. And it was very successful. Successful. The fact that this particular episode, and we'll get into that in a minute, but there were two <laughs> episodes based on the same story, but we're going to go with preventative medicine for the moment. That was very illustrative of that Bible because that was a real event that really happened. Not only did it was a real event that really happened, but it also created a riff between the two characters, Hawkeye and BJ, and perhaps a riff between Mike Farrell and Alan Alda. How big a riff it was, how much fisticuffs there were, we can... <laughs> We can find out from, from Mike. Uh, whether there was security called, there were guns drawn, I don't know. But we'll find out. But it has been over the years, I've been asked that question. Oh, what happened when they fought? Was there a big argument and they were mad? They were hitting each other or what? I said, oh, come on. I don't think they were hitting each other. But, you know, they had a disagreement. We'll find out. 
The other thing that I think is so wonderful and brilliant about this moment was, and I credit all the people that had anything to do with MASH, and I think it's the reason that we're all still talking about it 50 some odd years later, that there was a solution. And the solution between the rift between you two guys was brilliantly solved by Bert Metcalf, who said, hey, this conversation that you're, you two people are having is better than our original script. Let's make that the script. What I think is so wonderful about that is that this disagreement was solved by a brilliant idea and the truth was used. And that truth later became the truth of the screenplay, which later became the episode Preventative Medicine, which we've all seen. So I love the idea about the Bible. I love the research that Larry and all those people did and the, the reality behind that. And I love the fact that there was a disagreement, but it was solved with elegance. So we'll be right back after this. And that's <laughs> another episode of Mash Matters. Thank you for joining us. I'm going for a beer. Hope you guys have a good time. <laughs> <laughs> now, we're all here because we all have these moments involved with this. And Mike, you certainly were there. And Mr. Freeman is a researcher, a terrific writer, and he learned a lot about the Bible and did tremendous amounts of research about Larry and Gene and what they did and how it all worked and how they did it. Uh, Ryan and I started to try and do that too. And we got so far, but the pandemic hit. We couldn't get into various places to read things and you know, they wouldn't send us too much and so forth and so on. Mark, why don't you speak to that research that you did there and kind of give us a hint about what you did and then we can find out the truth about the fisticuffs. So during the pandemic, when you can't go anywhere, I, I, I got it in my head that I wanted to find that Bible. And I was wondering what happened to the Bible. And I contacted all the MASH writers. And I'm sure I asked you as well. And I asked Alan. And nobody really knew. Some of the writers didn't even remember the Bible. And then one of them, David Pollock, had two pages in his garage that he sent me. <laughs> <laughs> there were these interviews. It was fascinating. And I wanted, I, I thought, okay, I got to get more of this. And so we all researched where they were and everything had been given away to the Smithsonian, which couldn't get into at the time, pandemic. And then through some ways and means, which Jeff and I were trying to recall, uh, I came across online that Larry Gelbart had donated all of his papers to UCLA. Uh, it was like a hundred boxes. <laughs> so I contacted them and they don't have that digitized, but they have the table of contents of each box digitized. And so I was able to hunt down the Bible that way. And at first they also can't get in, can't do anything. Sorry, you know, maybe one day. And uh, this was the part you didn't remember, Jeff, which was if you want something from MASH, and you name drop that one of the MASH people is involved in wanting something from MASH, <laughs> they will they will get you things. And so <laughs> they ended up Xeroxing like 50, 60 pages for me that they sent, uh, you know, emailed it to me. And I think I even shared it with you at one point, Mike. Um, and I know I shared it with Ryan and Jeff. And it's fascinating, you know, and you, you don't even if you look at it, you don't even, you don't necessarily know who's speaking because Larry and Gene did a lot of them. But again, Bert. I don't know if you went on any of them. Alan went on some. Walter Dischel went on some. It just says interviewer. It doesn't even say who the interviewer is. But it's the responses and the underlinings in red when they find something that tickles their fancy that they think that they can turn mm. into an episode. Mm. And uh, it was just so cool to be able to find that by digging through. But that, that that's the gist of how that came across. But there's one other thing, too, that... Uh, I think Jeff, if you remember, that kind of led to this whole thing was in Jeff's garage, he found the original script to preventative medicine. <laughs> and so we got to actually compare what it was that bothered you versus, yeah. you know, what the correction is, which you can watch on television. Hmm. And that was really cool. Ryan and Jeff and I looked at that and we just were fascinated with that, just as much as we were fascinated with White Gold, which is the comedic Larry Gelbart version of the exact same thing mm -hmm. with the taking out the healthy organ, that you can take one story and make it funny, make it emotional, and then rewrite it. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. all fascinating to me. What we've learned so far is that if you really need something to help you find these answers... It's in the garage, <laughs> David Pollock's garage, Jeff Maxwell's garage. Mike, I don't know if you have anything in your garage that uh, would help us out with this, but uh, it seems like it's all in the garage. <laughs> I I want to read something, and I, I know you sent this, uh, Mark. I just want to read this. It's one of the things that was in that Bible, and it's, a, it's an interview uh, statement here from a surgeon. 
I evacuated a general once. This is a guy who was an executive. I wouldn't identify him. He'd still cut me off until the statute of limitations has run out. This guy was a first class son of a bitch. He was really demented. Uh, he was a two star general. He countermanned directives. He came in with a bellyache and I took his appendix out and he didn't have an appendicitis. Yeah. So golly, that's what we're talking about today. That's preventative medicine. And that's where it came from. That was in it, the inciting incident? Yeah. I'll be darned. Yeah. I'll be darned. Yeah. Again, 50 years later, we're talking about that statement. I don't know when exactly that statement was taken, but right. boy, and that's the real deal. It's amazing. So- all kidding aside about the disagreement between you and Alan, was there really, I mean, was there a, a hey, no, I don't think that's right and I'm not going to do it or how <laughs> did that work? <laughs> yeah, it's funny to, to, to hear that it got built up into a... Uh, oh, it it has. I've heard all kinds of stories. And You were a Marine, and so how would Alan stand up against a Marine? <laughs> <It's not gonna> <laughs> work. <laughs> He'd never make it. <laughs> no, the, 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 the fact is, it's very simple. Um, we did, as I suppose everybody who listens to your show knows, we did a reading um, at the first day of every show. And, um, you know, read through the script and saw what had happened and blah, blah, blah. It, it was one of the great things I remember about the show, because when I first came there, my first day on the show, we sat down and Gene said, OK, page one, and off we went and read through it. And at the end, there was laughter and there was applause and there was stuff. And then Gene said, OK, page one. And I, I, <laughs> I thought. Is there a time lapse here? Did I? What, how come <laughs> we just did page one? And he said, "Oh no, Mike. This is when I, I want to hear from you guys about uh, if there's uh, if you have any questions, any problems, any issues, any uh, suggestions." And uh, I was like, oh, "My <laughs> God, I have never in my life experienced a producer director asking me if I had any thoughts that would be <laughs> of, of interest, even much less benefit to the show." So I watched that happen, uh, and and I watched it happen every uh, every week. And the actors would say, "Well, what about how about this? And what if we did that? And what have you?" So many many years later, we did this show and read this script and got to the end, and everybody laughed and scratched and talked about it. <clears throat> and then um, I don't know if we I don't think this was page by page. Bert just said something about um, some question about uh, how, how do you feel? And I said, "Well, here's the problem." Um, BJ wouldn't do this. Mm. And he said, what do you mean? <laughs> I said, it was simple. Uh, this is something BJ Honeycutt wouldn't do. And we had quite a discussion. It was really interesting. And I said, you know, this is a character you and I are building here. And this guy has certain values. And there's no way this, the story for your audience is that, that, that aspect of your audience that doesn't know the story was that Hawkeye and BJ and, and then the bunch were getting a, a big load of wounded kids coming in, got kids, soldiers coming in and really frosted. The story was they were being forced on up to this particularly treacherous place, take this hill by this uh, officer who was their commander, whether he's a colonel or whatever. And we just really got frosted by it all. And then the guy, and of course, that's the way they worked the story. The guy came in to rally his troops and say, come on, fellas, we got to get you back and what have you. So Hawkeye and BJ decided, we're going to take this guy out of action. We'll slip him a Mickey. The, talk, the discussion was, we'll slip him a Mickey, tell him he's really sick, tell him he's got appendicitis, take out his appendix and um, take him off the line for a few days so that these guys would not be put in that position. So we laughed and scratched and said, well, that's a great idea. Why don't we do that? And um, later in the story, we did give him a Mickey. We did get him sick. And then Hawkeye said some version, I guess, of, OK, take him into the OR. And I, BJ said, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. You're not serious about actually operating on this guy. And he said, yeah. And that's when BJ and Hawkeye had the, the sort of uh, confrontation, such as it was, about you can't do this, or and ultimately I won't do this. But sitting around the reading, sitting around the table, it was just a discussion. I said BJ wouldn't do this, and uh, Alan said Hawk, I would. <laughs> <laughs> Is that when the fisticuffs started? <laughs> when started punching back and forth. And, and, who swung and, first? That's all I want to know. Yeah, who, who swung, swung first? first? Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> Everybody laughed, and and I said, I get it, I get it that Hawkeye would do it, but but uh, VJ wouldn't. And and we started talking about the medical ethics, and we talked about the cir- circumstances of the these people were in, and we talked about all the the salad around it. The discussion went on for, as I recall, quite a while, some 20 minutes or so, which was unusual about a single subject. And then finally, Bert said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He said, we've got a better story here than we've got on the pit. And um, and that was it. No, no punches. <laughs> oh, I know. I'm disappointed. Oh, well, thanks for coming, Mike. Thank you. <laughs> That'll be all. <laughs> so I'm sorry to, to, to disappoint the audience, but. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. It was really uh, an intellectual <laughs> exercise. Yeah. But more than that, it was. Uh, it, it got. It did get emotional in the sense that I was really intent on making the point that that when, when I said BJ wouldn't do that, I meant it. The BJ Honeycutt that I knew that I was creating uh, would simply not do that. He'd he'd you know he'd do a lot of things, and they did some tricks. Um, and so we could we can figure out something I think would have been BJ's um, take on it at that point. But the great thing about it for me as an actor was that this was part of the process. It's what I, it's why I call the show a, a creative community. It wasn't just the director and the producer saying, "Okay, here you guys do this." Uh, it wasn't uh, Larry Gelbart saying, "I wrote those words; you have to say them that way." There was a discussion about a lot of this stuff, and they honored our views. And that, to me, was first of all new territory. I'd been in two television series and a soap and a lot of other things, and rarely do you have the opportunity to say, "Wait, a minute, can I raise a question here <laughs> about the fact that you know you killed me on three pages ago?" And <laughs> the fact that they were as willing to honor my my particular position, simply one guy saying this story that you guys have cranked up here, yeah. uh, based on the and and as Bert at one point said, it's in the Bible, it's in the you know we, it's in the research. I said I, I'm not saying it didn't happen. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's wrong for you to have it in the story. I'm not saying it's wrong for Hawkeye to do it. I'm saying it BJ wouldn't take part in it, and and they got it, and that was. That was the magic of the show. It yeah, was yeah. it was this honoring of our intelligence and our in willingness to invest ourselves in these characters and and add input. Uh, there were times <laughs> to, uh, I can change the subject a bit if you'd like, but uh, or not if yeah. you rather. No, it's okay. No, please. You know, we did a show one year. Uh, uh, Hawkeye was having an affair with Blythe Danner, the character he'd uh, he'd had. Uh, an affair with it during medical school where they knew each other. And then suddenly she was a nurse officer uh, temporarily assigned to us and bong, you know, they're, and I think she was married. I'm mm-hmm. not sure. She was. But it ended. they were having this affair and, and, and Hawkeye and BJ, he and I were in the, either at that point it would have been, I can't remember if it was radar, still radar's office or Klinger's office. But by that time <laughs> we were in the office and he said something about, I uh, <clears throat> haven't been around lately because he'd been out with this woman. And I said, yeah, I noticed. I've been crying into my pillow. Oh, and he said, did you miss me? I said, oh, I've been crying into my pillow. And he said, "Um, do you uh, disapprove? And I said, not my place to disapprove. And he said, well, have you ever um, committed adultery? Or he didn't say adultery, but he said, have you ever fooled around? And I said, never. And he said, never been tempted? I said, tempted's a different question. (laughs) And and that was the joke. And Larry, yeah. it was great, and the scene yeah. went on. And, uh, and so we ended the, sh- the the scene, and everybody was happy, uh, as was I. And I went over to Larry, and I said, you know, that's a great scene. I love doing it. Um, but just to pick a point here, B, B, I like BJ, and he's a great guy, and he has a real sense of ethics, which I appreciate. But to suggest that he was never tempted is to make him inhuman i don't, mm-hmm. I don't mm-hmm. larry said oh that's that's an interesting point thanks and a year later gene came up to me and he said you remember that conversation you had with larry <laughs> uh, i said yeah yeah i do he said well how would you feel if bj fell off the fidelity wagon mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I said, wow <laughs> <laughs> and i said well uh, for me it depends on how you handle it, how it is handled. Mm-hmm. 
And he said, okay. And they went off to the writer's room and they came back with a story. And it was just, you know, it's just another example of the sensitivity of these guys. Yeah. And the willingness to to honor our take on the characters, our sense of who these characters were and how to make them true. Mm-hmm. I, I think about it all the time, frankly. I mean, I, I go back. I was just having a conversation with Harry Morgan yesterday. <laughs> I saw a picture of Harry and I said, God damn it, I miss you, Harry. Yeah. 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 I, miss, I miss being on the set with you and working with you and uh, mm. laughing with you and doing the jokes we did together and all that stuff. It, it's It was such a magical time. And being now one of the survivors of the cast, it weighs heavy sometimes. Mm -hmm. I get it. (laughs) Mike, this episode, Preventative Medicine, happened in season seven. And season seven is when, well, not only did we get the introduction of BJ's mustache, but it was also, it was kind of a turning point for BJ, the character. He became a little more... There, there. He became a little more serious. There, there was more agitation from BJ. There was more anger. Like Korea was finally starting to take its toll. It was a different layer to BJ that we had not seen. Was that a conscious decision? Did you have anything to do with that change, or did it just kind of naturally happen with the character? I don't remember. I certainly don't remember a conversation with Bert or anybody else about it, but I do I do remember a sense of, uh, I don't know quite what to call it, ownership of the character and a feeling of that great responsibility, personally. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you raised the point of the mustache. People <laughs> constantly, constantly say, what? why did you do that? Why, why did BJ have a mustache? <laughs> And I said, Alan called me and said, they think we look, they think we're too much alike. Would you be willing to grow a mustache? And I said, sure. <laughs> wow. I didn't know that. And then you got into a fist fight about it, right? And then, yes. yeah, you said, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I knocked him down and I sat on him. Yes. Said, must go. You go no, okay. the mustache. I won't grow a mustache. <laughs> Finally, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. I knocked him down and sat on him. All right. <laughs> Can we admire the mustache too? I mean, that, that's a wonderful, fully grown, equal yeah. sided yeah. mustache. Oh, it was beautiful. No, we had lots of fun with that. I had my little comb and you know, uh-huh. of course at the end what they did was take off half of it so that right. Was-, yeah. <laughs> right. was that kind of a weird experience though growing it i mean uh, yes for the character but just you as mike did you think oh gee i'm not crazy about this or did it work for you you know uh it sounded interesting and i'd i'd had a full beard at one point and the mustache came with it yeah enough <laughs> 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 No, no, it, it wasn't a big deal. I thought, oh, okay, no. yeah. My mother, however, my mother hated the mustache. <laughs> <laughs> That's well. I think mothers hate mustaches anyway. <laughs> I think they do. Wow, it tickles when you kiss me, <laughs> <laughs> or scratches. Yeah, it tickles is the nice version. <laughs> <laughs> my mother is the nice version. You know, you talk about the sensitivity that everybody had to the act. I went to them one time and I said, "Is there any way that Igor could have?" food that was edible and they said no <laughs> no i didn't get the i didn't get the creative part there but i tried nice try you know what the heck there's there's one thing in here i wanted to point out too because it was when i was doing the research of the research for this which was and and you've touched on it actually mike which which was taking something real giving it to the character you being ownership of the character and wanting to expand the character, the opportunity that came out of that. And so I had come across in reading the interviews, Ryan, you'll remember it first, because I had to look up the name of the episode. It's uh, season 11's uh, Bombshells, when you're supposed to go on a fishing trip with a pilot, and, and you go and you pick up one wounded soldier, and then there's a second wounded soldier, but the helicopter takes fire, and you have to cut the rope. You can't bring him up. Yeah. Which is heavy stuff, and you get a medal for it, which you don't want to obviously accept. So there's so much for you to do there as an actor. And then that really happened. They they said it was a rule. If you were flying a helicopter and you were under air fire, you just cut bait and went. And, you know, they took this real thing and they gave you this huge opportunity. Again, a great way to expand your, your character within something real, which I think is really cool for the writers. I think it's cool for you as an actor and us as viewers. Well, yeah, no, I quite agree. And I... 
uh, although I don't remember the conversation, I know I winced when I read the script. And I, I, I believe Bert told the story, said that that was in fact in the Bible and that there was that experience that somebody had or whether that they had had that experience, but it was part of the regulation. And you, you just take a sort of take a deep, deep breath and think, oh, God almighty, what would I do under those circumstances? And I remember seeing, I remember the show. Right? I remember how you, you talked, uh, I think, Ryan, at one point about BJ being not embittered, but harsher. Yeah. That was a, it was a hard thing to even portray um, and to, and to think about, and a lot of it's not even thinking, it's just intuiting how this manifests itself in terms of this guy's life. Uh, it was a tough one, tough show to do. Was there was there a show that you um, maybe this is unfair to say I mean there's so many shows but was there a show that you look back on and went oh, gee, I wish I didn't hadn't done that like that or that one or oh probably I don't I don't I don't remember any of them <laughs> yeah you blocked them out probably <laughs> I, I'm, no I'm really proud of the work that uh, that we all did but yeah. uh, really pleased with the integrity if you will of the work that I was able to do on the show. And the consistency that, you know, well, uh, when we did the show with um, Maggie O'Shea, where BJ just went, oh. got his head spun. Susan St. James. Yes. Yeah, man. I, they asked me to write that. And I wrote a version of it. And they wrote a version of it. It was very different from what I wrote. And Alan, I, I went to Alan. I said, read these two and tell me what you think. And he said, uh, theirs is better. That's when you hit him, right? That's when you <laughs> right, right cross, right across. <laughs> wow. There's this better. You talk earlier from an actor's perspective, being able to have that input after the table read. When you're on the flip side and you've written the episode <laughs> and you're getting that feedback, how is that different? Or is it different? Uh, the the uh, I may have told you this story before, but the the uh, the incident I remember the best is when I wrote a script and then was directing it. And I remember setting up the camera on a shot of uh, Alan and uh, Harry and David Styers in the, um, going in pre-surgery. And uh, I said, who wrote this shit? <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to say all this, for God's sake. The camera tells us this. <laughs> oh golly did you like the the writing process and did you kind of hey say hey, i'd like to do more of this or oh it scared the hell out of me i i came to bert uh i don't know early on with a, an idea i said i've got an idea for a story and um ran it by him and he said that's a great idea why don't you write it mm. and i thought well well <laughs> I, you know, I had done some writing, but I'd never done writing on this level. And I thought, okay. And he said, um, you, you know, don't worry. You put it down. We'll go into the room. The guys will beat you up about it. And we'll talk about <laughs> it and that and the other thing. And, and it was a wonderful process. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, the quality of the writing consistently that they did was such that I was always, when given the opportunity, just deadly afraid that i was going to be thrown out of the room um <laughs> so, but they were they were all very generous and we really got uh, some good work done yeah and how about the directing process same thing i went to bert one day and i said you know i've been looking and watching and i'd like to try one and he said absolutely you should and uh, i did and you know what better way to learn when you're directing a cast four of whom are directors yeah <laughs> Yeah, really? <laughs> they can say, "Hey, stupid! What are you?" <laughs> I remember when Bert, when Bert, you know, directed us. He'd say, "God damn it! I can which which way should I?" And we'd say, "This way, Bert. This we'll do this." And he said, "All right, all right." <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I keep going back to creative community. They encouraged uh, opinions suggestions and they didn't accept them all they didn't say oh yeah you're absolutely right we'll do it your way necessarily but in the critical moments if you were if, as lucky as i was um 
then they'd say, yeah, that makes sense. Let's try that. There's one thing I just wanted to, to bring up so that it wasn't lost in this, going back to the interview Bible for one sec, which is the emotion involved with the people who gave the interviews, the questioning that they, they got. It was it was very emotional. You can't always pick that up on the Bible itself, but there was a, a story that was told to me that before the show even started, they did one of these L.A. trips, and um, it was Larry, Jean, Alan, and Walter, and they went to this doctor's house, and he brought out these uh, eight millimeter films, which his wife had never even seen because it was so emotional to look back at the war. He had never wanted to see it or look at it, and so he said that they ran the film, and actually from that film came the swamp. And came the sign with all the cities. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, that's the fascinating part. The other part is just that these soldiers were telling stories they had never shared that they carried with them, which I think obviously adds to the emotional pathos of uh, all the episodes that you're building off a foundation of this horrific stories of uh, war um, and then building on that and then getting to do everything that you guys did with it. I, I, ju I just marvel at that process. Mm hmm. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Mike Hirsch, uh, some of you will remember his name. Mike was uh, associated with the show on a couple of levels, um, was a documentarian, among other things. And he did it and now has written a few books. But he wrote a book about uh, survivors of got uh, men who had been in World War II and had liberated the uh, Nazi concentration camps. And he said many of the people he talked to had never spoken of it before. Mm. Mm -hmm. their families hadn't hadn't talked talked to friends and and he said it was very difficult to get that out of them because it was such a horrific experience it, it, i was i thought it was interesting general milley the man of recently in the news uh, donald trump wanted to execute um <laughs> yes. said in his in, 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 of 40 years of being a soldier he said no one who's ever experienced any warfare any combat can avoid PTSD. Mm -hmm. He said, we all have it. How can one human being not, you know, avoid it? It's just a horrendous experience. And it's so heartbreaking to see so much of the world going through what is going through right now and has been going through that for hundreds and thousands of years. It's very, very disturbing and very sad. It makes me think of MASH and it makes it brings all the stories and all the behavior and everything, you know, right to the fore, because that's what MASH was about talking about that horrendous experience and trying to get through it, you know. I can't tell you how many letters I've gotten from people who say, my father never missed your show, but at first he found it very hard to watch because he never talked to us about mm. combat, whether it was Vietnam or World War II or Korea, whatever. So it's something that the human being bottles up and doesn't want to kind of admit to, mm. much less air. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Well, <laughs> uh, I have an idea. I have been told and I have learned that you, Mr. Farrell, have a new book coming out. Is that true? You, you, you obviously have heard from Lucas. Um, we have. Yes, indeed. <laughs> I would say that. He tells us everything. So go ahead. It doesn't matter what you say. <laughs> um, years and years and years ago, a woman from the Netherlands started a website about me and ran it for a long time and um, gave it up. Eventually, she just got too involved in her life. And, and I said, fine, you know, thank you for all you've done. And Lucas contacted me and he said, I'd like to sort of pick it up and put it back together. And I said, gee, you know, it's a big pain in the ass, I would think, but it's very sweet of you to want to do that. Well, he did a prodigious amount of work. And then he said, you know, you've done all these journals about your trips to at this place and that place. Wouldn't you like to have those put together in a book? I talked about them in the book I wrote, but I, <laughs> I just had a conversation with the publisher. I, I included them initially in Just Call Me Mike, and it ended up being 800 and some pages long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and the, the, the publisher said, Mike, we just can't do it, man. And I said, well, okay. He said, nobody, nobody. Other than Bill Clinton writes an 800 page <laughs> 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 and expects it to sell. Yeah. 
So what we did was I'd say I I'd made mention in the book of going to Rwanda or going to Somalia or going wherever and in Bosnia and whatever, and then would put in in the book a um, website where they could go to find that journal if they were so interested. Well, of course, that all went away when Linda's and the website went away. So uh, Lucas said, these journals, you know, people might be interested in reading them. What if I string them all together and make an ebook out of it? And I said, geez, that's a lot of work. I, I can't ask you to do that. I mean, it just seems like a hell of a lot of labor, and I'm not sure it's going to be of interest to anybody. And he said, well, I'd like to do it. So he did. And then I call, I, he sent me this thing, three versions of it, and then I called uh, Johnny, the publisher of the book that I did write, <laughs> that I actually wrote, <laughs> and I said, is that a problem for you that there are these? And he said, as long as he didn't lift from the book, then no. And we didn't include those. So that's fine. So I said to Lucas, if you want to, you know, make it available to anybody who's interested. Yeah. Is there a title? One Man, Two Wheels, A World of Change, The Life Journey of Mike Farrell. All right. Terrific. And that is available on Amazon now as an ebook. Well, I was going to say, because Mike, you're always too modest, but I mean, Mike's had a lot of adventures as an activist and seen a lot around the world that I think most MASH fans aren't aware of. Just the, the, the tease of stories that you've given me over time always just kind of amazed me. Even life stories when you were like a, a, a struggling actor. Some of, some of those which aren't necessarily journey around the world activist stories, but that's just you as a good storyteller. But um, I, I just want to get that point across that in the activist world, in the progressive world, uh, you are held in high esteem for the things that you tried to do and did an advocate for. And I think that's, I'm sure that's reflected in that book. And rightfully so. Thank you, Mr. Farrell, for that work you do. No, no, Mr. Farrell was my father. Okay. <laughs> well, thank him, for God's sake. Yeah. But Lucas is a hell of a nice young man. He's in Slovakia. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some Somebody from Russia sent me an email, uh, uh, autograph request, and I signed it, a picture, and sent it back. And uh, it came back to me. It said they wouldn't, couldn't be delivered. So I contacted Lucas. I said, what's that about? And he said that American male... They've now cut it off. Oh, wow. They won't, hmm. they won't accept mail from America. But he said, I think if you send it to me, I can get it to him from Slovakia. So, wow. <laughs> yeah. He's quite a nice young man. Yes. Wow. And he helped you with the website. What is the website? Beats the hell out of me. <laughs> well, that's a strange title for a website. Is that dot yeah, org? Dot com or <laughs> dot UK? What is that? Let, let's see here. <laughs> it's Mike Farrell dot site. Oh, ah, interesting. Yeah. Okay, I'll check that out. You should check it out, Mike. <laughs> yeah. It's a nice looking yeah, site. You yeah. <laughs> He's an interesting guy, that Mike Farrell, too. It's amazing. <laughs> That's a good job. And, you know, I have to say that in the world of books and so forth and writing, I have to uh, tip our hats to uh, Mr. Mark Freeman, who is a terrific writer. And he, you know, he wrote for Hollywood Reporter. And you did, what was it, 2018 you did that? For MASH, yeah. Yeah, the oral history of MASH. And it was terrific. And that's how, how we, uh, well, we knew each other before then, actually. We had met on the set of MASH 100 million years ago when you were an infant. I <laughs> and uh, I made a funny face at you and you were appreciative of that. And I carried that story for 40 years, never <laughs> thinking I would have the opportunity to tell Jeff that story in person, which was in between shots, Jeff in full medical gear with the mask over his face. I looked at him. He looked at me, he went cross-eyed, and I thought it was the funniest thing ever, and <laughs> it stayed with me forever, and then there I am. Mark wrote a hell of a book about... Modern Family. Modern Family, yeah. yes, one of my favorite shows. Terrific book. So anybody wants to know more about Modern Family, please go out and buy that book, because it's you will learn a lot of stuff that you never knew about it, and you'll enjoy doing it. And you can go to uh, Amazon.com and buy... <laughs> <laughs> Secret to the Mash Mess, The Lost Recipes of Private Igor, the 50th Anniversary Edition. Buy two or 300 copies just for your friends. <laughs> Do not try to eat any of it. <laughs> <laughs> 
yeah, please stay away from the food. But the book is not bad. The book itself is tastier than the food. Yeah, much tastier. <laughs> <laughs> little barbecue sauce and you know, little tenderizing. It's delicious. You can suck on those pages. <laughs> oh my goodness! And and Ryan, you have your book coming out, right? It's called. Um... It's called. I don't know what I'm doing. It's uh, my life story. <laughs> yes. I've said it before, and I want to say it again to Mark, this podcast would not exist without Mark Freeman because it was the oral history that he wrote back in 2018 that really inspired me to uh, reach out to Jeff and start doing something in a podcast form that was similar to what, Mark, you wrote in that oral history is just doing a podcast that tells the whole story of MASH. So thank you, Mark, for your work, because without your work, and your research, I don't know that this podcast would exist. Wow. I didn't know that. I didn't either. Well, that's wonderful. I'm starting to tear up, actually. I know. <laughs> a little succinct. I mean, we're not going to give you a cut of anything, but we wanted to let no, you know that, you know. You. No. <laughs> <laughs> no there, was, there were so many great stories from that oral history that I couldn't put in the oral history that I went back to the editor and I said, because apparently everybody really loved hearing from everybody. And I said, you know, I got more stories. And and I actually did a, it, it wasn't really a cohesive thing, but it was additional stories from, you know, MASH. And, and it was a mini oral history. Mm -hmm. And on top of all that, I, I still ended up with loads and loads of interviews from that show and stories that I just couldn't fit into a periodical. Hmm. How, what form was the oral history made available? I believe it was only online. It's online, Hollywood Reporter. Um, I don't know if they ever made a hard copy out of it, but you can find it now. In fact, there were like three things I wrote in a row for that, because that was the, the oral history, the kind of oral history, <laughs> and then a tribute to uh, David Ogden Stiers, who had passed right around the time of the publication of that. And I happened to have stories of people talking about him and being a prankster and so on. And, and so I asked if I could just do that piece to pay tribute to him with things that I had already accumulated. So oh, that's great. And we'll put links to those also in the show notes for this episode, too. So if you have not read those or if you want to reread them, you can do that. So listeners, you have a whole lot of reading to do. A lot of reading. A lot of homework. <laughs> Don't be tested. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It will be on the test. It will be on the test. <laughs> And if you'd like to read a book that Mark and me and Ryan tried to get uh, sold, you can't because yeah. it didn't sell. <laughs> <laughs> but it was going to be really, really good. <laughs> oh, it, but you would have really liked it. <laughs> wow. <laughs> oh, golly. Well, hey, I th thank you, everybody, for doing this. You have finally laid the rumors to rest that there was no fisticuffs. And uh, yeah, I saw them recently and I said, you know, they think we fought physically about this. So. Put them up, buddy. <laughs> so, so hypothetically, if you had fought, would you lead with the right or do you start with the left jab? I just want to put you like... Think I'm going to tell him? God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. Oh, this is great. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mark. Uh, this has been really terrific. I, I appreciate it. And we love doing this. You know, Ryan and I love doing uh, MASH Matters and we love hearing about MASH. And, you know, you think about MASH Boy, I think about MASH more than I ever wanted to think about MASH because of MASH Matters and because of the podcast. So I, I can't stop thinking about it, but it's a wonderful thing to think about. So I thank you. I'm so glad we're friends. I'm so happy that you were able to come to visit with us today. And thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you to Mark and Mike for joining us once again. I think this is uh, Mike's third appearance on the podcast, and Mark has been with us before as well. So it was a family reunion here on MASH Matters. It was. And if Mike makes a fourth appearance, we're going to have to pay him, I think. And that's going to be... <laughs> That's going to be a rough day. Hey, before we go, let's say hello to some of the folks who are supporting us on Patreon, including Private Mark Gayer, Private Kevin Nye, Corporal Lisa Ciceri, Corporal Mark Slayton, Captain Kerry Everly, Captain Amy Hodson, Major Kiranjeet Singh Budeo. 
Thank you for your support on Patreon. You too can support the show for as little as $3 a month. Just go to matchmatters.com slash support. Yes. That last name that we mentioned, Kiran Jeet, we want to say a big salute to her because she is going to be helping us out with a pretty big project. One of the great things about podcasting is that we can come on these microphones and just say what we want to say and put it out there for you to hear. But there are some folks out there hearing impaired who maybe can't enjoy the podcast in the same way. And so many podcasts will include transcripts. We have not been able to do that up to this point. Kieran Jeet has started a business called Checkmate Editing, and she is going to be doing that for us. A wonderful offer to do that for us. And uh, we are very, very happy to be able to bring that to everybody. And she's the reason we are able to bring that. So a very deep thank you to her. Now, this is going to be a long project. This is going to be a time-consuming project. When she gets to around episode 42 or so, she is going to really regret ever coming to us with this proposition. But until then, she has offered to help us with the transcripts for the show. Now, what we're doing is we're starting back with the first episode and we're adding them from the beginning. So it's going to take us a while to get caught up. And uh, eventually we will have transcripts for all of the episodes. That is because of our friend Kieran Jeet, who runs Checkmate Editing. And you can check out her website, checkmateediting.ca. That's checkmateediting.ca. And I've had a long conversation with her, and uh, she has agreed to make me sound much smarter than I was on the original (laughs) broadcast. So I really appreciate her work. Kieran Jeet, can you make me sound thinner? (laughs) That would be great. Maybe a thinner font? Yeah, <laughs> yeah for just your lines, it'll yeah. be a thinner font. And <laughs> I can be a smarter font and it'll be really good. Hmm. Also, one more thing before we go. We do have links to Mike's new ebook in the show notes for this episode. You can also find links to all of the articles that Mark has written about MASH. You can find the link to buy the DVD, MASH, When Television Changed Forever. You can also find the link to buy Jeff's cookbook, the 50th anniversary of Secrets of the MASH Mess. There's a lot of linking going on, huh? We got we have linking everywhere. Yes. <laughs> hey, I just want to say a special thank you to Mike Farrell for being a part of this uh, episode. He's a wonderful guy. Yeah. I'm so grateful that I have have his friendship and I've known him for so long. And also to Mark Freeman, who is also a friend and a wonderful writer. So thank you to both of them for taking time to, uh, to visit with Mash Manor. Until next time, here's looking up your old address. <laughs> <laughs>